Good evening, my brothers and sisters. I'd like to welcome you all to this Ash Wednesday service here at First United Methodist Church in Los Angeles. A special welcome to our guests this evening. And for those who are worshiping with us online, thank you for welcoming us into your home or wherever you're gathered for worship. I'm Reverend John Nash. I'm joined in worship leadership this evening. Kenneth is our lay reader. Yelena is on piano. Valerie will be leading us in hymns. In the sound booth, we have uh, Philip, Lynn, Abigail, and Samantha, and Julie was acting as our ushers. So thank you to them for their worship leadership as well. John Wesley, the founder of the Methodist movement, said, Whoever you are and whatever faith you were born, whatever creed you confess, if you have come here to find God, to encounter God, you are welcome here. And we are indeed glad that you are with us for this special service. So we hope that you have come with the expectation that we will encounter the risen Christ. The Holy Spirit will be moving and working amongst us here this evening. It will be transformed simply by gathering together as the body of Christ. I'm going to invite you to stand as you are comfortable. Remain seated if that is more comfortable as Kenneth leads us in our call to worship. We come to worship God as the Lenten season begins, aware of our own fragility and fa failings. We, we come, come seeking, seeking God's, God's mercy, acknowledging, acknowledging our, our mortality. mortality. Having received the waters of baptism, we are marked now with ashes. The, the treasures, treasures of this, this earth do not last. last. Our, our treasure, treasure is in heaven, heaven our, our heart's true, true home. As we begin our Lenten journey, let us confess our sins before God and one another. In preparation, present yourselves before God. Come in your brokenness, acknowledging where you have fallen short of God's expectations and of your own. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. The, the brokenness, brokenness that, that hinders, hinders me, me I lay before you, O God. Come in your pain, acknowledging your hurt and accepting how you have hurt others. Do not cast me away from your presence, O God, and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. All the, All the pain, pain I, I have in my life, life the pain, pain I have caused, and the, and the pain, pain I feel, I lay before you. Come in your weakness, acknowledging your lack of confidence to do what is right. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. The, the weakness, weakness that, that holds me captive, I lay before you. Come in your fear, acknowledging your failure to seek justice. Do not cast me away from your presence, O God, and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. The fear, the fear that, that binds, binds me, me I, I lay before you. you. Come in your hesitancy, acknowledging your resistance to God's call. Have mercy on me, O oh God, according to your steadfast love. My hesitancy, My hesitancy in, in doing, doing your, your will, will I, I lay before, before you. Come in your failings, acknowledging what you have done and left undone. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and put in a new and right spirit within me. The, the hollowness that, that saps, saps my strength and leaves, leaves me, lifeless, me lifeless, I lay before you. All that we are, all that we have done, all that we confess, we lay before you, O God. 
relieve the weight of the burden I lay before you. Amen. The prophet Joel reminds us that God is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. With great mercy, God relents from punishing and calls us into fullness of life. In God's grace, know that you are forgiven. In God's mercy, know that you are made new. In God's love, know that you are made whole. Thanks be to God for this good news. Part of what we do in the season of Lent is to quiet our minds and souls and center ourselves in God. And so we begin with the call to come and find the quiet center. By the illumination of your Holy Spirit, O God, open our hearts that we may hear your word and amend our lives through Jesus Christ. Amen. Our first scripture reading for this evening is the traditional reading from the prophet Joel, calling us into a time of repentance. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Blow the trumpet in Zion. Sound the alarm on my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord is coming. It is near, a day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and thick darkness. Like blackness spread upon the mountains, a great and powerful army comes. Their likes have never been from the old, nor will again after them in ages to come. Yet even now, says the Lord, return to me with all of your heart, with fasting, with weeping, and with mourning. Rend your hearts and not your clothing. Return to the Lord, your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, and relents from punishing. Who knows whether he will not turn and relent and leave a blessing behind him, a grain offering and a drink offering for the Lord, your God. Blow the trumpet in Zion. Sanctify a fast. Call a solemn assembly. Gather the people. Sanctify the congregation, 
Assemble the aged. Gather the children, even infants at the breast. Let the bridegroom leave his room and the bride her canopy. Between the vestibule and the altar, let the priests, the ministers of the Lord, weep. Let them say, Spare your people, O God, and do not make your heritage a mockery, a byword among the nations. Why should it be among the peoples? Where is their God? Our second reading is the traditional epistle reading from Ash Wednesday and comes from Paul's second letter, letter to the church in Corinth. Paul writes, We entreat you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake, he has made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. As we work together with him, we urge you also not to accept the grace of God in vain. For he says, At an acceptable time I have listened to you, and on a day of salvation I have helped you. See, now is the acceptable time. See, now is the day of salvation. We are putting no obstacle in anyone's way, so that no fault may be found with our ministry. But as servants of God, we have commended ourselves in every way, through great endurance, in afflictions, hardships, calamities, beatings, imprisonments, riots, labors, sleepless nights, hunger, by purity, knowledge, patience, kindness, holiness of spirit, genuine love, truthful speech, and the power of God, with the weapons of righteousness for the right hand and for the left, in honor and dishonor, in ill repute and good repute. We are treated as impostors, and yet are true, as unknown, and yet are well known, as dying, and see, we are alive, as punished, and yet not killed, as sorrowful, yet always rejoicing, as poor, yet making many rich, as having nothing, and yet possessing everything. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Jesus calls us to come and follow him. And as we begin this 40-day journey through Lent, ending in the celebration of the resurrection as Easter, of East, at Easter, So normally each summer, I put together a calendar of the 
summers, the Sundays for the coming year, so I can sort of plot out what's happening. And I normally then uh, put out the, the days and then look for where the high holy days are going to be. And so last summer I was looking, starting with Christmas, which I decided to put on December 25th this year. They changed it up a little bit, which was nice. Then I look for where Easter is going to be, right? Is it going to be early in the year? Is it going to be late in the year? Last year it was uh, April 9th. The year before that was April 17th. So this year, March 31st is Easter. And then marking backwards, where's uh, uh, Ash Wednesday going to be? And I saw that it was going to be today, February 14th, Valentine's Day. And I thought, oh man, that's not good. And of course, to be honest, my first concern was not sort of a theological argument about how am I going to match up Lent and Ash Wednesday with Valentine's Day. My first thought was, well, we're not going to have very big attendance in the evening. I hope lots of people show up for our noon service. So I thank you for being here tonight. Proved that other part wrong. And then I began to move on to think about what am I going to say about Ash Wednesday on Valentine's Day. Because at least as we normally think about, the themes of Lent and the themes of Valentine's Day don't really match up with each other. One is a season of, of preparation, right? The colors are purple and gray and black, right? Sackcloth and ashes. And then Valentine's Day, happy red, right? All those pinks, all those sort of things that go along with that day. And even though we use the same word, passion, for both of those things, they have very different meanings. Right? When we talk about the passion of Christ or the passion story, that understanding of the meaning of passion, the much older meaning, is one of pain and of suffering. We still hold that in, the, in words like compassion, which means to suffer with. But it wasn't until Shakespeare began using that word passion differently that it began to, to take on a, a meaning of love for another person, or at least a lust for another person. And thus it would appear on its face that today's celebration of Valentine's Day and Ash Wednesday have two different meanings, two different meanings that don't really match with each other. So how do I even try to reconcile these things? But then I began to think about the season of Lent and what we do and of Christ's mission. And it actually turns out that Valentine's Day and Ash Wednesday, or the season of Lent, aren't really all that far apart because they all deal with love. In six weeks, we'll be back here again uh, for the Monday Thursday service to remember Jesus' last night. It's also the uh, opening day for Major League Baseball, a day on which hope springs eternal. And so I will be celebrating that as well. I don't expect all of you to be thinking of that on Monday Thursday. But we get the word mondi from the Latin word mandantum, which means commandments. And it's based upon Jesus' commandment that we hear in the readings for that night. For us to love one another. That we will be judged as his disciples by the love that we show to the world. So it's like that passage we just heard from Paul's second letter to the Corinthians. That juxtaposes seemingly opposite ideas. Because Paul says that we are sorrowful, yet we rejoice. We're poor, yet we're rich. We have nothing, yet we have everything. And these, those, those don't seem to go along, yet they actually are not as opposite as they might seem. But to get to that love being the main theme that we can hold on to this Lenten season, we have to get past that idea of what most people think Lent is about, that time of being penitent and having to suffer because Jesus suffered. And you know that giving up chocolate or TV or coffee is just like being flogged and crucified, right? But that was actually only one of the reasons why Lent came into existence in the early church. It was a time for those who had been removed from the church to prove their, um, their repentance, right? 
And so they'd cover themselves in ashes and sackcloth as an act of repentance so that they might re- be re-welcomed back into the community on Easter. But it was also a time of preparation for those who would be baptized on Easter. And Easter was the only day in which you could join the church. It was the only day on which you could be baptized. And we'll schedule to do some baptisms on Easter this year here in this congregation. And so for those who were seeking to be baptized, it wasn't a season of repentance. It wasn't about ashes and sackcloth. It was a, a time, again, to celebrate about what they were about to enter into about being adopted as sons and daughters of God, to die to their old selves, their old way of being, to be reborn in Christ. So they spent these 40 days learning more about what it meant to be a disciple, of deepening their relationship with God. And it's not that there isn't an overlap between those two groups of people, because there is, but in some ways it's different. But when everyone was being baptized and uh, infant baptism became the, the regular practice, the medieval church tended to focus then just on that repentance and the ashes and sackcloth parts, the penitential aspects of the season, ignoring the preparation part because they didn't do that anymore. And so that became the, the aspects of the season that have sort of carried over to us. But that doesn't tend to really emphasize the nature of Easter or of why Christ was sent because God so loved the world. That Lent and Holy Week and Easter are all wrapped up in that idea of God's love for us. And that certainly has overlap then with Valentine. So if we are going to proclaim ourselves as Christians, that means that we have to be in relationship with God. And we have to be doing things that deepen that relationship with God. So if we're supposed to be showing our love to our beloveds on Valentine's Day as a reminder that we're supposed to, really supposed to do that all the time, then Lent does the same thing for us in our relationship with God. It's a time for us to be deliberate in showing our love for God and deepening that relationship with God, focusing on that relationship for these 40 days to build us up to do the same thing all the rest of the year. As Paul said, it's time for us to be reconciled with God. And notice it does not say that God reconciles with us, because God is always faithful. It's we who go astray and need to be reconciled to come back to God. And So this is that time, that season, to be intentional and deliberate about coming back to God if we have gone astray, where we might have wandered off, where we might have not been as paying as much attention to our relationship with God as we might. That's why the spiritual disciplines play such a critical role in the season of Lent and why people take those on, things like fasting and prayer and meditation and silence and confession. We take those on not to punish ourselves, not to do sort of self-flagellation, but to deepen our faith, to focus our time and our energies on our God. And our mission here as a congregation, we say, is to be God's love in action. So Lent should help us to live into that even more, to be God's love to the world. In Hebrew, the verb to know is yada. Yes, like yada, yada, yada. Different connotation, though. One of those connotations is to have intimacy with another person. So we often say they knew each other biblically, like Adam and Eve knew each other. But it doesn't actually have to mean that. Because we also read 
that God knew Abraham, that same word. It's about knowing someone in a way that's well beyond superficiality. It's knowing everything we can about them, and yet also knowing there's so much more we don't know about them. And we are called to know God in that same way. Yada also has the meaning of knowing and practicing mercy. And so Proverbs says that the righteous person knows, yada, the needs of their animals. That is, they do the right thing for them, even though their animals can't speak for themselves. And so it's knowing and, about pra- knowing and practicing mercy for those who don't have a voice. Another meaning deals with acting justly or of doing justice in the world. And of course, if we're truly working and knowing God, justice and mercy will just naturally come out of the things that we do in the world because they're not just what God calls us to do. They are part of how we love God, how we abide in God as God abides in us. And so in 1 John we read, Beloved, let us love one another because love is from God. Everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love God does not know God, for God is love. God's love was revealed to us in this way. God has sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. And this is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sin. Beloved, since God loved us so much, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God lives in us, and his love is perfected in us. By this we know that we abide in him and he in us, because he has given us of his spirits. And we have seen and do testify that the Father has sent his Son as the Savior of the world. God abides in those who confess that Jesus is the Son of God, and they abide in God. So we have known and believed that the love that God has for us, God is love, and those who abide in love abide in God, and God abides in them. Love has been perfected amongst us in this, that we may have the boldness on the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishments, and whoever fears has not reached perfection in love. We love because God first loved us. And so this Lenten journey is a call for us to return to God. To return to God's love and to focus our time and attention on coming to know Yada, know God better. To be reconciled to God and to learn to love the Lord our God with all of our hearts and souls and mind and strength, with all that we are and all that we have. And to take that love and to love our neighbors as ourselves. Because God's love abides in us, we are called to live that love out in the world. Not just for 40 days, but for every day. To love one another. And so it turns out, actually, that Valentine's Day and Lent are perfect companions to each other. And so as we prepare on this night to begin this Lenten journey, I invite you to open yourselves not not just to receive God's love, but to learn to abide in God's love, to take on a Lenten practice of going forth to love others. Because that is how we will be known as Christ's disciples, by the love that we show. I pray that it will be so, my brothers and sisters.
Amen. Now I'm going to invite you to stand as you are comfortable. You can remain seated if that is more comfortable for our hymn of response. We can encounter God where we want to be, only just as we are. And you may be seated. The trumpet sounds not for glory or notice, but to call us to God's love and grace. We are gathered in worship not for publicity or praise, but to remember of our need for grace. We are called to pray not for appearance or show, but for a renewed spirit and a heart of love. So as we pray, Petition will be followed by me saying, Lord, have mercy. And we all respond, Christ, have mercy. Let us pray. For grace, where, where we are in need of love. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. For forgiveness where we have sinned. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. For forgiveness where we have been sinned against. For renewal where our spirits are dying. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. For restoration where we are disconnected from the vine of life. Lord, have mercy. 
Christ, have mercy. And with the confidence of children of God, let us pray as Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, the early Christians observed with great devotion the day of our Lord's passion and resurrection. And it came to be the custom of the church that before the Easter celebration, there should be a 40-day season of spiritual preparation. During this season, converts to the faith were prepared for holy baptism. It is also a time when persons who had committed serious sin and had separated themselves from the community of faith were reconciled by penitence and forgiveness and restored to participation in the life of the church. In this way, the whole congregation was reminded of the mercy and forgiveness proclaimed in the gospel of Jesus Christ and the need we all have to renew our faith. I invite you, therefore, in the name of the church to observe a holy Lent by self-examination and repentance, by prayer, fasting, and self-denial, and by reading and meditating on God's holy word. The cries of Hosanna we hear on Palm Sunday quickly turn to cries of crucify. And so it is a tradition to take the dried palms from the prior year's Palm Sunday celebration and to burn them to make the ashes as a reminder of our need for repentance in this season of repentance and preparation. Again, I invite you to stand as you are comfortable for our hymn of preparation for the imposition of ashes. And the Lord be with you, and let us pray. Almighty God, you have created us out of the dust of the earth. Grant that these ashes may be to us a sign of our mortality and penitence, so that we may remember that only by your gracious gifts are we given everlasting life through Jesus Christ, our Savior, and all the church says, Amen. So I'm going to invite you, as you are called, to come forward, and I will make the sign of the cross on your forehead. The response for me is, from dust you are made, and to dust you shall return. So you come down the center aisle, form one line, and since there's only one of me, so come.
So I again invite you to stand as you are come to remain seated, if that's more comfortable for him, a response celebrating God's love for us. So you're invited to join us on, for worship on Sunday. Again, our Lenten series will be looking at the baptismal questions we uh, answer in preparation for uh, renewing our baptismal vows as well as baptizing people in the church on Easter Sunday. Jesus began his ministry by proclaiming repent for the kingdom of God has come near. And so as we travel this journey of faith, may these days of repentance and preparation help us prepare our hearts and minds for the coming of Easter so that we might be able to proclaim that good news of the kingdom of God to all the world. So go forth, and may the love of the Father, and the strength of the Son, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you today, tomorrow, and forevermore. Amen. Now go be the church. Amen.